Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old-fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your audio technician, Sammy Reed, and I'll bet my voice wasn't the one you were expecting to hear today. Well, that's because Eric managed to catch a cold and lose his voice, and I'm coming to you at his behest with a little holiday cocktail content. This time around, we've got a selection from an interview we conducted back in 2020 with acclaimed cocktail writer Aaron Goldfarb, whose book Gather Around Cocktails is filled with advice for making eggnog and hosting holiday cocktail parties that celebrate all kinds of festive occasions. I do have one quick housekeeping note from Eric before we jump in, and that is to make sure you check out the community Discord where there's a very important and timely call for questions about a mysterious chartreuse replacement that's about to burst onto the scene here in the U.S. spirits market. So definitely check that out and submit your questions. And if you're not a member of the Discord, you can email podcast at modernbarcard.com and we'll get you a link to join. With that, please enjoy this special holiday-themed re-release from Eggnog Guru and award-winning cocktail writer Aaron Goldfarb. Uh, and and that's one of the things that I enjoy about about your work, and I think that's a good segue to kind of talk about gather around cocktails um, because like the thing that I immediately enjoyed about the book is that you you seem to have written it to solve a very specific problem, and uh, I'd love to hear you kind of articulate that problem that you kind of announce in the introduction and then, you know, just give us uh, the approach that you took in the book. Yeah. Well, you know, so my, my previously I'd written a book called Hacking Whiskey with this uh, publisher Dovetail and I had such a great experience and the book did very well and I I got paid pretty well. And as, as my book tour was wrapping up, I said, Oh man, I got to work with these guys again. That was really fun. It was fairly lucrative. I really got to work with them again. Uh, so, you know, I pitched him some more ideas and I pitched him, I love eggnog. I pitched him an idea. How about an entire eggnog book? You know, single drink books are hot right now. You had Brian Bartle's um, uh, Bloody Mary book. Of course, Robert Simonson's old fashioned book. I said that, Let's do an entire eggnog book. And they said, that's the worst idea ever. How about we do a book that's partially eggnog, but then cocktails for every other holiday? And I thought, okay, that's a good idea too, because eggnog is really the only like official holiday cocktail. You know, what's the official cocktail of Thanksgiving, which is coming up? What's the official cocktail of Halloween? What's the official cocktail of Valentine's Day? None of them have official cocktails and most of them don't even have something you could think of. You know, it's not like there's several cocktails vying for the official cocktail of, of you know, the 4th of July. So uh, I believe there's 48 uh, recipes in the book for 48 holidays or gatherings or events, events, i.e. Super Bowl party or whatnot. You know, Kentucky Derby, that has an official cocktail, obviously. Um, and I, I try to name what's going to be the official cocktail for each of those with help from bartender friends, with help from, you know, drink makers who have come up with these official cocktails in their own minds, who have said to themselves, why isn't there a Hanukkah cocktail? Um, and there's a great Hanukkah cocktail in the book from Heim Dauerman uh, here in New York, um, who, who's Jewish and came up with with a Hanukkah cocktail I love. Um and, uh, you know, any holidays that didn't have cocktails, I would try to come up with one myself. And there's there's certainly some cheeky holidays in there. There's, you know, holidays that probably don't even need a cocktail, you know, stuff like Yom Kippur. I'm not sure if that needed a cocktail, but, uh, you know, that adds to the fun and the reverence of, of what I was trying to accomplish. Um, and again, beautiful photography from Dubtail Press, who did a great job with my previous book. Yeah, it's, it's a really fun book. Uh, and I think... Um, you know, one of the things that, that I really love about it is is that you sort of, un, you kind of call out a problem with our culture. Uh, it's a problem that maybe not everyone would agree with, but it's one that I tend to agree with, which is, I, I think somewhere along the line, you say, maybe that time was the 90s, uh, like parties got lame. 
Like it, it started, it started to be just a bunch of, you know, suburban adults getting together and having polite conversations with other suburban adults with the most interesting thing possibly there being sangria, which was just wine dumped over fruit. And, right. and, and, uh, I, I agree. I think, I think more parties than not tend to be lame. Um, can, can you talk about just like that opinion and, and like what led you to it? Because I find it really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, when I started going to colleges first, I mean, parties first in college in the late nineties. And then as I became an adult and, and moved to Manhattan in the early aughts and I started going to these parties, you know, it, it was, you know, show up with a six pack of Bud Light and plop it on a table, drop a bottle of Bacardi and a two liter of Diet Coke. And all right, this is the party. And I, I would always think to myself, man, this is, you know, I could do this on a street corner. Um, New York's an interesting place for parties because we have very tiny apartments. So how are you going to knock anyone's socks off? Um, when I started living with my uh, future wife in, in 2012 and we started hosting cocktail parties, I tried to put in insane efforts into always creating something for the party, whether that was a homemade eggnog, which you still don't really see a lot of people do, even though it's quite easy, you know, mold wine in, in winter or, you know, just putting out a big punch. Uh, you know, when we got married, I registered for a giant punch bowl and, and there's nothing easier and more fun than making a one of a kind punch. Uh, so that's what the book's pushing for. You know, don't just plop a, a few bottles of, of $20 wine on your table and open a bag of Tostitos and, and call that a party. You know, try, try to think of something cr clever, try to put some effort in, try to give people a reason to go, wow, that, that was cool. I've never seen something like that before. Every year around the 4th of July, my uh, good friends and I, we get together and we watch Mel Gibson's The Patriot. And nice. uh, in, in addition to the, uh, you know, quantities of, of light beer or uh, or uh, cheap lagers that are consumed, there is also I, I, I always uh, go out of my way to make a traditional colonial era punch. So we have nice. we have. Uh, you know, tri corner hats. We have <laughs> traditional colonial era punch and and the other other stuff. And and I find that 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 makes it for me. You know, you know, it's it's part part of the ritual of doing that thing is the time I spend in my own kitchen creating that punch, batching it up, and you know, thinking up like, all right, what am I going to do this year? All right, well, last year, you know, we featured uh, Jamaican overproof. Maybe this year I want to feature like a, a Demerara or something, uh, something along those lines. You know, so even even something like that, trying to impress the same people, even the same like two or three people year after year, is 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 enough of a impetus for me to sort of like get excited about the holiday. And uh, even if the hangover the next day makes it really, really tough, uh, <laughs> it's still something that, that we all kind of, um, you know, get on each other to, to continue doing year after year. And, and we, we've probably done it like six or seven years in a row now. So um, that's my little holiday anecdote. But um, one thing I want to talk about with this book is, is sort of the format of it, because I, I find it really interesting. It's both encyclopedic in that it's, a list of holidays, right? It's like a holiday and cocktail mashup reference guide, but it's also cyclical. And it's sort of like, you know, it's almost like religious books are cyclical, the, the Bible, the various, um, you know, various um, like uh, monotheistic religious texts tend to kind of circulate over the course of whatever the religious year tends to be. And I, I think it sort of follows that in a sometimes religious, sometimes just like Stonehenge cycle, like where we're following the, the cycle of the season. So could you talk like, was that an easy decision, like in terms of how to set that up? Or did that come somewhere along the, the drafting process? Well, it's interesting you noticed that it was actually difficult for us to decide how to structure it, you know, structuring it from, you know, New Year's Day, January 1st, all the way to New Year's Eve felt a little weird. I wanted to start kind of with the holiday season, the, the Christmas, Hanukkah, winter season, and then wrap it back around again. Um, I also thought those were the most exciting recipes. Those were going to be the recipes that most drew people into buying the book because that's when people are most throwing parties. Uh, so that's what we ultimately decided on. Um, I can't remember the second what the first recipe is in the book, but I I remember it starts early with the eggnogs and and wraps its way back around again to uh, to uh, fall and 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 
winter and another year. Yeah, that was totally intentional. Yeah, and and uh, well, it it also makes sense in that like you wanted to do the nogs, so you front load the nogs, and oh, it's like and, and and suddenly you're going right. You suddenly you're sort of on your way around the uh, around the sun for uh, a revolution. So, um, yeah, I I just um, I I really love the uh, the eggnog section because you know one thing that became apparent you know you mentioned that of course you you tend to throw these uh these eggnog parties you say that uh you've even done some eggnog aging uh so i was wondering if you might be willing to dive into some pro tips for our listeners because obviously you know the guy who wrote a book called hacking whiskey is clearly familiar with things like fat washing and clarification, like all the like sort of sciencey projects. So um, I'm wondering if you can take some of that technical knowledge and apply it to our listeners who probably have the basic kitchen tools and maybe a decent set of bar tools that you, you would expect to have in, in a cocktail aficionado's home. Yeah. Eggnog is kind of the one cocktail where you need more culinary tools or baking tools than bar tools. And I actually hate baking. So it's funny. I love eggnog um a stand mixer is critical unless i think i say in the book unless you have the forearms of roger nadal because you're not going to you're not going to be getting uh your your egg whites uh fluffed up so you you need that um and other than that eggnog is really hard to screw up you know it's it's booze cream sugar and and eggs whipped together and and blended and and it's not like a two ounce drink where if you you get it a quarter ounce wrong it's going to taste off if i get my eggnog too boozy i dump in more milk if i get it too thick i dump in more milk if it's not sweet enough you dump in more sugar it's something you can really constantly tweak it's something you can use just about any spirit um i've never made a gin eggnog but i'm sure it's pretty good you can use brandy, you can use bourbon, rum, cognac, armagnac, aged tequila, you know, just about anything works. And that's what makes it fun to tweak. You can add spices and seasonings if you want or not. You can shave on a little nutmeg at the end or dump in loads of, of cinnamon or whatnot. It's really something you can tweak because sugar, fat and booze is a, a recipe that never fails. Exactly, exactly. Now, is there a particular order of operations that is either recommended or that you tend to follow when you are adding the components to the vessel to be kind of whipped together? Yeah. I mean, if you look, if you Google eggnog and probably look up the first 20 recipes, every single one is going to have a different methodology for how they do it, but everything ends up in the same place together. Another critical thing for eggnog is having a lot of damn space, which, you know, in New York is, is difficult, you know, you're going to need several giant mixing bowls and then a final vessel to, to, to put it all together. Um, I usually separate the eggs, which is, is never fun. Uh, you know, you do that thing where you kind of dance the eggs back and forth between the shells. And then I add all the components to the, uh, yolks, uh, that's sugar, uh, sugar and booze. Um, I, I whip the, the whites, and then I fold them into that mixture, and then I start adding um, milk and cream, mm. and then tw- and then tweaking from there. Yeah, and and so that process in its in and of itself is inherently interesting because we have single serving what we might call approximations of nogs in in the flip format, right? That it's yeah. a you know you take. A shot of booze, you take usually some sort of liqueur or amaro. I'm personally very partial to the fernet flip. Uh, and you add the you know you add the whole egg to the cocktail shaker. Depending on who you ask, you might do uh, a dry shake. Depending on who you ask, you might do a reverse dry shake. You know there 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 are uh, many varieties of egg experience. Uh, but but I I do think that for people who are curious about the science of it and pe- people who are interested in either formally or informally keeping track of the outcomes of their large format projects at home. I think that the separation of the whites from the yolks is at least initially a really good idea because it allows you to kind of isolate your variables and, and sort of see in real time as you fold in those egg whites. Well, well, what happens, you know? And I think that that's from the technician's standpoint, a glimpse into the cocktail shaker. When the cocktail goes into the cocktail shaker, you don't know what's going on. It's getting beaten up in there. You know, it's getting diluted. You know, it's getting mixed, 
but you can't really see what's going on visually. And so I think what's compelling to me about the, the instructions that you just gave is that you kind of like really get to, you can really kind of fine tune it and, and see really engage with the process. Um, do you, do you have any um, recommendations in terms of um, service methods, uh, hot, cold, if it's cold, are you going to serve the nog over ice? Well, you know, I'd say my biggest tip is to prepare it at least a day early. If you're having a party, I feel like even a day really things start happening and I've made eggnogs, you know, the night before a party and taste it. I thought, damn, this is just not very good, but I, you know, I have gallons of it right now. So what am I going to do? I'm not going to start over and throw it in the fridge. And, you know, 18 hours later, it's incredible because it mellows out. You know, I've built up that body with the egg white, but it's it's kind of relaxed and now, you know, the the alcohol's burning off a little bit. Uh, so I'd say throwing it in the fridge and letting it just mellow for for an overnight is is great. If you can mellow it for a week or two, even better. Um, I always serve it serve it neat in a glass straight out of the out, out of the fridge. I don't like it too cold, but you know, if you put it out on your kitchen island or, or counter or table and it, it sits there for a few hours as the party goes on it it's it's a good temperature so are there any um sorry i'm just i'm fascinated by nogs and we're coming <laughs> sure. up on this season um in terms of substitutes or um, dietary things if let's say that one of our listeners was um trying to create a vegan friendly nog or something uh, that simply uses something like uh, a coconut milk and a, or a coconut cream, for example. Uh, are there any things to look out for if you start diverging from the, you know, full egg cream and booze format? Is there any format that that is is in your experience really easy to, to kind of morph into from the dietary perspective, and or are there any things to kind of look out for and avoid? Well, you know, I haven't made a lot of vegan or, you know, vegan eggnogs in my life. Although there are two vegan eggnog recipes in the book and both are quite good. Um, they use, uh, avocados, which add a nice creaminess and richness and don't impart that much flavor when you're, you're adding booze and whatnot. So I'd say that's good. Um, I, I believe there's, there's egg replacements out there. I've, I've never tried those, but, you know, again, you know, I think the vegans <laughs> vegetarians know better than me what what simulates milk for them and what simulates eggs for them better better than I certainly do you know th th this if anything it's probably easier because you have no fear of curdling or separation when you're using um, non eggs or non non dairy products but um, yeah I mean it's 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 like any drink you know slot something in for that creaminess slot something in for the the fluffiness of the egg, you know, a lot of people use aquafaba in egg white drinks that, um, if they're, if they're vegan, that's uh, chickpea, chickpea water. I've never heard of an aquafaba, um, eggnog, and that would certainly take a, a ton of, uh, a ton of, uh, chickpea water to, to do. You start adding chickpea water and avocados and, and pretty soon I think you're going to have like a, a Greek salad instead of an eggnog, but, um, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it can be done. And as I said, booze and fat always works. Yeah. And well, and I think, uh, eggnogs too. I mean, eggnogs are supposed to be a little bit naughty. They're supposed to be a little bit cheeky, right. you know, some, yeah, you know, it's something that you would give a kid minus the booze. Yeah. And yeah. so when well, you add the booze in there, it's basically, you know, it's an, it's a cold, it's an adult milkshake served holiday style. Right. Um, well, that's great. I, and I, I love, I love the nog section in your book. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, a, uh, I tend to maybe not every year, but I almost always make a coquito, which is yeah. sort of the port, the Puerto Rican, uh, equivalent there using, um, coconut milk and, you know, one of the various coconut sweeteners. Um, so, so that, that's also an option to look into if, if folks are, um, on the on the dietary um, replacement train, kind of trying to figure out what exactly they can they can do to um, accommodate for their guests. So um, let's talk about some of the other drinks in your books. Um, as you went season by season, did you find yourself identifying like 
any trends or any common sets of ingredients that, that you found yourself drawn to more than others? Because I know that when we speak with either our listeners or other guests, they tend to say that they're seasonal drinkers and that their favorite cocktails, for example, vary season by season. So is that something that you encountered while writing the book? Well, yeah, of course. Um, you know, I think it's interesting when most people talk about seasonal drinks, they talk about what spirit they're using, you know, whiskey for the winter and maybe gin for the summer or whatnot. Um, I think the drinks are made more seasonal well, by, by the modifiers, by not the booze, by what fruits and what juices are being used. You know, you might add, you know, cucumber and lime in the summer to a punch where, whereas, you know, there's a Thanksgiving punch that has, has cranberries and, and rosemary and thyme in it. So I think with, with seasonal things, you're looking for more, what is what is being grown right now. Go to your local farmer's market and, and buy what's there. You, you know, you're not going to probably have a winter peach punch, but you'd have a, a peach punch in the summer, for instance. So I think that's a, a good tip to just see what's at the farmer's market, what's being grown at the moment. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then... One, we, we mentioned this earlier, but the um, the cocktails that were sort of specifically designed around the, the Jewish holidays were right. really compelling to me because you, you don't see a whole lot of stuff out there. Now, maybe on the day or in the week you know, preceding one of these these holidays, you'll see an article or two from a publication or two, and then they'll sort of fade into obscurity because – Chances are it's it's a custom cocktail um, that that just doesn't have legs, or it's such a close variation on a classic cocktail that people are like, eh, fine. What was it like creating those cocktails? And uh, can you just walk our listeners through a couple of them as exemplars? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm Jewish. If you couldn't guess from my last neg and, and my love of eggnog, um, I I love eggnog because I was uh, you know denied it as a, a young Jewish boy. So. Um, but having said that, I, I'd also love, uh, some Jewish drinks for Jewish holidays. And, and even though people don't believe it, Jews actually do like to drink a lot. Um, uh, so I, you know, I looked at the, the Jewish holidays on the counter calendar and, you know, a lot of Jewish holidays are incredibly serious. They're not, they're not, uh, we don't have mascots like the Easter bunny or Santa Claus. We don't have, you know, giant spreads at Dwayne Reed with candies and pastels and whatnot. They're very serious. They're holidays where you don't eat food for 24 hours or you're in synagogue for six hours. Uh, so I had to identify the holidays where you'd even have the possibility of drinking. Um, Hanuk Hanukkah is an obvious one. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Chaim Dowerman's um, uh, uh, cocktail, uh, which is meant to um, replicate a uh, uh, suf sufud jet. I don't, I don't even know how to pronounce it. I'm a Jew. It's, it's kind of, it's the fried jelly donut. That's kind of the, second most favorite food stuff after latkes for Hanukkah. And it's, it's a quite easy cocktail to make both single serving and batched. And, um, I enjoy that one. Um, uh, what else did I have? Purim is actually the Jewish drinking holiday. You're supposed to drink so heavily that you forget all the grievances held against us. Um, so for that one, um, I said to myself, well, uh, hamantashens are the most famous thing we eat on Purim. I wonder if anyone on planet Earth has ever made kind of a drinkable hamantashen. And I found this woman in Ohio who actually did. So that was just send her an email and let's let's get you in the book. Um, you know, she, so she makes she makes um, cocktail flavored hamantashens. Those are the kind of triangle cookies if you if you are not Jewish, which are typically in kind of boring like grandma flavors like poppy seed and prune and whatnot so she makes like daiquiri hamantashens and and margarita hamantashens and on the reverse she makes makes cocktails that that resemble those and then uh what what's the other holiday i have included can't remember oh passover of course passover is another holiday where we drink we're supposed to drink four glasses of, of wine during the, the Seder. Well, you know, I'm not really a wine drinker. Uh, and, you know, a lot of younger people aren't. So I said to myself, what if what if there were four perfect cocktails we could drink during the, uh, the Seder? Now, this is one I came up with myself. And um, Passover has lots of rules. You, you can't, actually can't drink grain-based spirits on Passover. You can't eat bread. You're not supposed to eat leavened bread. Uh, 
You're supposed to eat matzah, of course. What you can drink is agave spirits because that's not grain. Um, so I made essentially a New York sour uh, using uh, tequila, egg white. E eggs are a big part of the Seder plate. So that's an egg white drink as well. And then I made a haroset syrup. That's a kind of fruity little berry dish that's a side. And then it uh, includes a float of uh, kosher wine. So you do get a little wine in that cocktail. I love it. I love it. Uh, <laughs> did did you ever think to uh, include a uh, a hangover after the uh, or a hangover remedy after the the perm section? A hangover after the perm section. No, that's a good idea though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe for the next the next print the next printing of the book you you're gonna want to do that because <laughs> if I've got Aaron Goldfarb encouraging me to uh, to get hammered on the day that I'm supposed to get hammered I'm I, I'd like I'd like a little bit of assistance the next day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. I guess the next thing that we need to ask, kind of wrapping up here, is um, you know you've got all these holidays, both religious and secular, both major and minor. You know we've got the. Uh, We've got the Groundhog Day cocktail that uh, can be served warm or cold, yeah. depending on whether or not uh, whichever rodent is currently the artist known as Puxatani Phil sees his shadow, right. um, which I love. So, like, you know, it gets it gets as, as trivial as Groundhog Day and, and as you know serious as as the Jewish high holidays and everything in between, both national and, you know, non-national. Um, are there any holidays that you either had to omit or that if you were to do another printing of the book that you would want to, to slide in there with a cocktail? Well, one of the toughest omittances was, and, and it had been written up and it had even been photographed, uh, was another Jewish cocktail. I guess they, they didn't want the book to be too Jewish. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, uh, it was actually for Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the holiday where we fast for, for the entire day. And uh, at the end of the holiday, at uh, sunset, Jews have what's called break fast, uh, where after not eating all day, they kind of gorge themselves on typical Jewish foods, but often bagels and lox and and whatnot. So I thought, but but th but there's never drinks at break fast. Maybe there's a glass of wine or something, but there's never drinks. Uh, so I thought, what about a cocktail that would be perfect for break fast? Um, and it would supply you with the electrolytes you've been missing all day because you haven't been eating or drinking. And that would, of course, be a Bloody Mary topped with a bagel of lox. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And... Keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly.